things for which I got the Nobel. The, uh, uh, maybe the most, uh, I used to think the most important was to, to come up with a different framework for uh, asking uh, macroeconomic questions uh, based on people's and businesses' optimization of problems, uh, especially dynamic optimization, uh, which, which was quite different from the framework that used to be uh, common, just uh, posing a system of equations, so-called ISLM. Uh, has yeah, gone, I learned it in the university. Pardon? I, I learned it in the university oh, when you, I you studied know. economics. So. Yeah, well, ISLM is now you don't see any research papers mm -hmm. anymore based on that framework. It's mm -hmm. all uh, people's, based on people's optimization of problems. And, uh, and, and we found a way to calibrate models and, uh, and, uh, and that seems to be the, the way every, everyone does it these days. So, mm -hmm. so I think that had a lasting effect. But, uh, but these days, the uh, the time and consistency issue for uh, uh, of an optimal government policy, I, I think, has become quite relevant, uh, and so uh, that's what I like to talk about in keynote addresses, mm -hmm. or use as a theme in, in my keynote addresses. Mm -hmm. But when you develop these these topics during your research, did you already have the idea that well, that this is a big thing that maybe could get me a, a big oh, prize one day? Of course not. Of course not. <laughs> <laughs> but speaking well, of... Well, but you yeah. see, uh, Norwegians wouldn't be uh, likely to think that way, because Norwegians are by nature modest. Mm. So. <laughs> and, and the problem of time inconsistency and what you, what you mentioned when you addressed it uh, here, here today, um, how do you think could, could uh, politicians nowadays look a bit more to, to the results of uh, economic scientific work and especially your work, well, what should they... Well, well s some have. I mean, uh, if you talk to a uh, central banker, uh, see, one of, one of the implications is that uh, it would be, if uh, politicians intend to carry out reasonable policy, uh, it would be good to have a commitment mechanism to ensure that they follow through on that policy. Uh, and uh, in the monetary arena, the, uh, one way to do so is to make the central bank independent of political pressure. And, and if you talk to central bankers, as I have in uh, Norway, Sweden, and so on, they, they understand that uh, that is an important issue, and, uh, and they feel they have set, set up their uh, institutional arrangement in such a way as to be able to carry out a consistent and uh, reasonable policy. Um, the difficulty is in the fiscal arena, which to me is uh, much more important for the real economy, and, uh, and there it's much harder to see how you could commit uh, policy makers. And I think that has been one of the biggest problems in the past five years. But as you mentioned, the, the monetary policy, uh, I mean, when you look at the US and Europe at the moment on the quantitative easing, do you think there is still credibility in the market? Or didn't the, the central bank lost credibility? Japan. Uh, uh, Japan, yeah, of course. Be because of, the, uh, of their recent behavior, I'm getting more concerned that, that, that first of all, they seem to be dabbling in, in uh, fiscal policy, which uh, I think is not the arena of uh, the central bank. And, and uh, to me, their, their, their recent behavior gives cause for concern about mm -hmm. their uh, future independence and about the predictability mm -hmm. of, the, of their future policy. Mm -hmm. uh, my last question before we go over to you. Um, you you work very closely with Ever Prescott during your, your, your time at university. Yeah, uh, how, uh, no longer, but I mean, it's been. Yeah. Uh, Years and years since we have. But, but how was it? How is it to work with him? Oh, I, I think we are a great team, and mm -hmm. so uh, 
but plus I enjoy uh, knowing him personally. Uh, so, uh, so that worked very well. Is this the one experience together you made together with Mr. Presley, which really stays in your mind, which will you always remember some, something special that maybe happened during your work? That's always hard to think about off, off the top of one set. If you gave me <laughs> time to think about it, I, I suppose that means that uh, everything was great. There's no, no particular uh, thing that stands out. Question uh, regarding the, uh, the situation, the economic situation in generally speaking in the world, but especially in Europe, because in those days I, I heard a lot of messages from former European leaders or very important people, our Nobel winners, blaming the European leaders on a lack of vision and a lack of uh, courage to action. So. Some people say they don't act right now, although we need some urgent measures to get out of the Europe, of, out of the crisis. But also they don't have the, the courage of quality uh, decision and the vision that the, former, the, the founder fathers of the European Union had at that time. So do you think it's, this is, could be a problem for Europe today, the yeah. lack of vision and the lack of courage? Well, or uh, lack of, I would say lack of consistency. Uh, when uh, troubles arose, uh, they took some measures, very careful measures. <laughs> it wasn't obvious they were, they were the right measures. It didn't work, then they changed to something else, and uh, then they changed again. Uh, I think the big problem is the lack of predictability of uh, what they're going to do in the future. They don't seem to have a clear and well-defined plan. Uh, I, I think it's clear what the problem is. It, you can just take a look at the data and, and you'll see that, for example, for Italy, Spain, and Portugal, pro potential future problems. <laughs> uh, if you look at the data, um, see the driving force for, for growth in the nation has always been uh, uh, innovative activity, research and development, and so on, and that shows up in uh, uh, data such as what we could call the total factor productivity, uh, how productive the combination of capital and labor is for the nation, or it, it, it will more or less show up in labor productivity. So if you look at those nations going back, say, to 1960, it's growing at a reasonable rate in all three nations. In 1990, from 1990 on in Italy, completely flat. You talk about innovation. Oh, e either what I call total factor productivity or, uh, or, or just a simple measure of labor productivity. Uh, How much output of per, per uh, yeah, 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 labor? Yeah, yeah. Yes. Completely flat. I mean, in, in, in Italy, the, ch the chart is astounding. I mean, today, it's at the same level as it was in 1990. So, so in, uh, same, um, in Spain, the slowdown started three or four years later, so like around 1994 maybe, flat. Uh, in Portugal, uh, it, the growth continued to a uh, little later in the 90s, but then it became flat. So, so it's pretty clear what what the what the problem is, uh, that, or what they have to what politicians have to do, that they, they have to find out what to do to to reverse this uh, flatness and and uh, and make uh, innovative activity uh, uh, grow again. Um, so so uh, I think all the the eurozone crisis may have been good for them. <laughs> I sometimes make an argument. It may have been good for them because the, I don't think the problem really was the Eurozone uh, or the Euro. Uh, but uh, but uh, the crisis exposed this problem that I just described. 
and now they have a chance to do something about it. Um, but, uh, and if they do, they, they could get Reverse. things moving it again. But uh, I'm not sure politicians are thinking that way. But which do you think are the risks? I mean, the South is getting lower and lower. I mean, I'm, I'm from the Eastern country, which is also in the South part of Europe, from Romania. So we have many problems. How, how are you doing? Uh, so how is Ro Romania doing? Uh, it could be better. I mean, in the papers we are all right. We uh, have a small economic uh, growing gap of 0.7 last year. But uh, it's too so little so for, uh, so for our country. And we are outside the Eurozone area. In the <coughs> oh, you are outside? Outside, yes. We, we will enter maybe uh, to 2020 or 2019. So, do you know anything about this situation regarding Eastern Europe? No. It's more affected no. or less by the Eurozone? No, I, uh, I know only about countries I've visited and, and they're not really in the East Europe. Uh, I, now I've been four times to Kazakhstan, I have, I've been three times to Azerbaijan, and, and so I know quite a bit about them. I, I use them in my, uh, in my talks. Uh, I'd like to start off my talk with a picture, a plot of GDP per capita for uh, for a bunch of countries, and I've included those two countries in my plots. But the, uh, I, I suppose what I know the most about are the uh, Estonia, Latvia, and Lithuania, and they seem to be doing relatively well. Uh, they seem to have. A, you talked about lack of courage or lack. Mm -hmm. They seem to have had more courage than uh, than most, and that seems to have worked. See, the um, I think what politicians are afraid of are uh, they are afraid of short-term pain. Mm -hmm. But to remedy the situation and get going in the long run, you have to expect some short-term pain. And if you can get the long run going, that's much more important than uh, this little. Uh, this uh, short term thing. Thank you. Uh, Professor, I have two quick questions for you. The first one is uh, we saw again today that Tokyo is falling down, Tokyo stock market is falling down, and probably your future are not going back, and we see the same thing that we saw yesterday. What's going on? I mean, it looks like we make uh, one step forward and two step back. What, what's going on? Well, what's, I don't, I don't, what's the driving force behind that? I don't follow stock prices. Uh, that's not